If you have your Bibles, please turn to Revelation chapter 2. And, and again, if you attend our Saturday night service, you know you kind of get me raw and uncut. So this is it. Here we go. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice uh, the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. That is so much going on right there, right? So let's bring our, our, our guest up to speed. The book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible, a collection, a library of 66 books, and these are our Savior's famous last words. This is the exclamation mark on God's written revelation for humanity. It's truly remarkable. The book of Revelation, as we've discussed, is drenched. It is clothed uh, with scripture that the, uh, no, the number of times that it references God's word is extensive. It's, there's a lot of references, and so understanding the whole arc of the biblical narrative uh, really helps you understand some of the imagery that is meant to jar you. It is meant to stretch your thinking. It is meant to maybe even uh, elevate your vision of Christ as well as stir a sense of wonder within you as to the possibilities of uh, his desire for you, while simultaneously graft within you uh, some steel within your spine. To, to give you some wisdom and awareness also that you can discern uh, the times in which you're living and you can live faithful to the cause of Christ despite pressure and despite persecution and despite the fallen wickedness of our world. Revelation says, this is our king and as his children, we march to the beat of his drum and as we do so faithfully following after him, his promises are fulfilled and we live victorious lives more than conqueror type lives. Greater is he that's within me type of lives. Victor and champion lives where you may have uh, some tears in your eyes and you may have a heart that is broken, but somehow by the grace of God, you can't miss. It's, it's kind of the heartbeat. This is a book that gets in your face. It, it is a book that will not allow you to come to Christ and walk away neutral. You cannot come to Christ and say, well, he's just a good guy, good teacher. Wrong. He's either God. He's either the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of all. He's either that or he is a maniacal madman, narcissistic cult leader who duped humanity. If he's not God, he can't be good. The lies he would have been telling the manipulation, the way in which he influenced culture for his agenda, the way he got people to give their lives fully for his purposes and cause, if he's not God, that's not right. You can't come to Jesus and walk away neutral. And at some point, whether this side of eternity, whether this stage of your life, whether down the road when you're facing an illness or whether you are navigating financial crisis, there's gonna come a moment that life humbles you, pain shakes you, and you discover you can't do this on your own. At some point, folks, I, I, I just gotta tell you, we all bend the knee to this Jesus. Whether you're a Christian or not, you'll bow. You will bow. And it's just recognizing uh, as believers, we ought to live every single day fully aware of who King Jesus is. 
But a lot of times we're, we're losing sight of Christ and we're, we're walking through life, myself included, distracted by wickedness and evil and all the treacherous things around us. And we're losing confidence. We're losing boldness. We're losing our zeal. We're losing our passion to advance the cause of Christ and to go after those who resist the faith and who scripture would say are blind and lost. And this text and this study and hopefully these sermons would just spark something in your soul to say life matters. The gospel's important. Everybody lives forever somewhere. If you're not a Christian, this is as close to heaven as you'll ever be. But if you are in Christ, this is as close to hell as you'll ever be. We live in the tension of that reality. I don't like it. Much of it is our doing as believers who in our brokenness allow this stuff to manifest in the world, but it is recognizing our only hope. Our only hope. It doesn't matter if you're a teenage girl, it doesn't matter if you're a retired gentleman, it doesn't matter if you're a toddler, it doesn't matter what your status is. It doesn't matter how much money you make, how gifted or talented you are, your resume does not matter. Your only hope is Christ. You can't get by on good logic. You can't get by on good performance. Our righteousness is but filthy rags in comparison to the holiness and righteousness of God. And a friend just lost his life, and I can't get up here. Not tell some of you that there is a God who... I told my son, if you ever cry in front of people, just pinch yourself, but my hands are in my pockets and I can't do it. <laughs> Don't gamble with your life because you're too prideful. Don't gamble with your kid's life because you have a hard time parenting them through priorities. He's King Jesus. He's King Jesus. And, and the world is gonna do what the world does and you and I are gonna pass away. And listen, for those of us who are 30 plus and in the faith, you're fine. We're good, we're in. We're in. By the time this stuff really gets destructive within our culture, God will have called us home according to our life cycles. But our children and our grandchildren and the grandchildren that you're never gonna meet are gonna face such wickedness in this world that if you and I don't stop playing it cute in our faith and pass on to them a faith in God that works and a church that is stable and is strong and a place that they can run to in time of need and in time of hurt and in time of pain, we set them up for fail. We set them up for fail. Your only hope is Jesus. And you and I have a lot in common. We are both wretched, broken sinners in need of an overwhelming, life-altering, heaven-shaking, earth-redeeming grace. He comes and he says to the church in Pergamon, this is the word of the Lord. These are his words talking directly to this church. And he says, these are the words of the one with the double-edged sword. And this is the first mention in a letter that Christ makes to a church in the book of Revelation that starts to come with a judgment tone. The, 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 the letter to Ephesus is, you know, this wonderful vision of Christ. You know, you kind of have those introduction, he's the alpha and the omega, the one among the lampstands, the one who holds the stars, and, and the one who is with his people from beginning to end. So those are all those wonderful things that we read about in chapter one. But also in the vision and description of Christ was the fact that out of his mouth comes this double-edged sword. And Christ, he says, and I will come and fight them with my sword. 
Folks, what do we make of that? Got a lot of cute theologians trying to take the teeth out of the gospel. What do we make of hard truth? What do we make of the text that makes us squirm? What do we make of the words of Christ that think, what does that mean? And he says, you live where Satan has his throne. Where Satan lives. Folks, Satan is not everywhere. Do not give him that much credit. He is in no comparison to our God. He is not omnipresent. That is an attribute of the divine, not Satan himself. The devil is more restricted than you realize. John's writing this letter on behalf of Christ, and Christ says, but if you want to know where the devil's headquarters are, you want to know where his throne is, it's right there. Here's what's amazing. A lot of Christians walking around getting discouraged. I find myself bumping into things that zap me of my joy, zap me of my peace, zap me of my hope and confidence. Anyone find that like one of your greatest challenges in this season of life is managing all the healthy emotions and thoughts? <laughs> Holding it together, fighting for peace, fighting to smile, fighting to just continue moving forward with this optimistic hope that he is still good, he is still faithful. And we are zapped of our courage facing the things we're facing in a nation and a culture that is still influenced to some degree by the Christian faith. A, a culture that still is hanging on by a thread to Judeo-Christian values and you can still drive down the street and see houses of worship gathering and people doing so freely. So we still have it pretty good. There was a church that was one time so close to wickedness, so surrounded by evil, that they were in proximity to the throne of Satan. And what's amazing about that is somehow a church survived near the throne of Satan. Those are the saints I wanna meet in heaven. I know Abraham's story. Introduce me to the Pergamum folks. You were faithful through all of that? You had the righteous resolve, the confidence in Christ? You took your licks, you endured your pressure, you went through suffering and you faced affliction, but you held on to God's promises and his truth in your life? That's amazing. I was asking my son, Miles, who is a riot, and I was telling some friends last night, my, my buddy Miles, he started about seven years ago. Uh, he would go to bed and he would say, Alexa, read the Bible. <laughs> and so every single night, Alexa reads the Bible from cover to cover to Miles. And he's been doing that every night for seven years. And I think that stuff gets in by osmosis. Like, I don't know, it's, <laughs> it's landing. And he goes to a school that places an emphasis on the faith and he is being raised in the best church on the planet. So the kid is just really sturdy in his faith and he has a good handle on the Bible and I love asking him intriguing Bible questions to hear his thoughts and he's already like this miniature theologian. The other day I was asking him questions like, hey, who in the Old Testament would you give advice to if you could? Like you gotta ask a question that'll make him think. And he's like, Moses, he should have listened to his father-in-law. Like, why is it so hard to listen to your father-in-law? And I, I love that. The other day I said, what is one of the, what is one of your favorite themes in the Bible? When you think of the themes that come to the surface in the Bible, which is one of your favorites? And he goes, faithfulness. I didn't expect that. I said, faithfulness, explain that. And he goes, those people in the Bible they made it so long and so far in their faith. Look how old Moses was. Look how old Noah was. They, they literally took it to their death. He goes, I'm so inspired by how faithful they were that they made the long haul in their journey with Christ. And that last sentence is how I would say it. 
But I love that idea, faithfulness. It's not going the fastest, it's going the furthest. It's can you stay to the course following this Jesus? And he says, listen, I, I, I think you can, despite where you live. You are in the city where Satan lives. Yet I still think you can be productive for the kingdom. I still think my will can come to pass in and through your life. And I still think it is possible for you to live as a light within utter darkness. I believe you can do it. Folks, if, if the church in Pergamum had individuals who could remain faithful next to the headquarters of hell, you and I can remain faithful in a culture that is contemplating making its greatest exchange, which is going to be devastating for our culture, and that is to lay down values that I think are critical to our society. I, I, I just think this passage makes you think. It lists out names of people, and you're like, okay, now, now I gotta figure out who this Balaam guy is, and I gotta figure out who this Balak guy is, and I need to know who the Nicolaitans are, and what's with the white stone, and then there's the man of bread thing, and don't you start reading it, and you're thinking, all right, we, we've read five verses, and I have no idea what we're talking about. And the Balaam Balak story is, it's pretty comical. Balaam in, you know, you find in numbers and so forth that he was this sorcerer and he was uh, hired by a guy by the name of Balak to curse the nation of Israel, to curse the people of God. And so there's this amazing moment where he stands to utter curses over the nation of Israel and as he opens his mouth to curse them, God ushers blessings through him. He's trying to curse the people of God and all he can get out is a blessing. That's, that's, that's hilarious. Like try to envision experiencing that. You cut someone off in traffic and you already know what's coming. They pull up on the side of you. You've heard the horn honk. You see the window coming down. You see the scowl on their face. You see one finger pointed to the sky and you know what they're gonna say. And so you roll down your window and they say, have a great day. I love you and so does Jesus. You would be like, I, I did not expect you to say that. Balaam tries to curse the nation of Israel and all he does is end up blessing him. Turns to Balak and he says, I can't do it. I can't curse the people of God. He can't curse the people of God. So what is our option? Well, if you can't curse them, corrupt them. So this is what Balak is told to do by Balaam. Balak was uh, a leader of the Moabites, uh, infamous enemy of the Israelites in the Old Testament. And Balaam tells Balak to get some of their Moabite women to go and seduce the Israelite men into sexual immorality and idolatry and to begin inducing, uh, introducing pagan worship. And so basically, Balaam's strategy is, hey, here's how you do it. Seduce them to moral decay. Se seduce them to compromise, and we'll destroy it from the inside out. And so what you have is this situation where they re recognize and discover we cannot curse this, but we can corrupt it. And that's exactly what happens. They corrupt it, and they start to return the nation of Israel back to pagan worship. What is interesting is the things they started resorting back to were the very customs and rituals and idols and pagan worship that they were accustomed to in Egypt when they were slaves. So God brings the nation of Israel out of Egypt. He frees them from Egyptian slavery and bondage, he introduces a, a new covenant and a new standard, and here's the law, and here's God's desire for your life. And he, he establishes this in the wilderness. Nation of Israel begins to get his feet underneath them, and here comes this attack from Balak and the Moabites. And what happens? They start returning 
to familiar sin. They had experienced freedom. They had experienced breakthrough. They had experienced God's provision and his pardon. They experienced his delight in them and his goodness. Yet they get to a point where they start to make compromises and before long, they start returning to familiar sin. And I have to tell you, I, I look at people who I've had the privilege of pastoring, watching individuals who've encountered this amazing Jesus, radically saved and redeemed and just changed from the inside out, but then they get into a season down the road. And for some unexplainable reason, they start returning to familiar sin. And I felt all week like, oh man, I don't wanna preach this because one thing I'm going to have to put in front of our congregation is if you would allow me to be your pastor, some of you are returning to familiar sin. Cracking the door on compromise, flirting with the world. This idea that, well, if we can become like the world, maybe they can become like us. No, you live set apart. You operate at a standard that honors God. You live righteous and pure and full of integrity and the world will notice that's different and that's better. Look at their marriages, look at their children, look how they endure suffering, look how they steward resources. We don't need to be like the world. This doesn't mean that we get to look down on them. It means because we've been radically redeemed and saved by the same grace, we now have to look out for them. Hey, there is a King Jesus, and he's your only hope. And compromise is, well, I think it's something that every single one of us is gonna be faced with the temptation. What exchanges, what trades, what's the decisions? Are we getting more comfortable with and turning a blind eye to. I love reading what some of the classical theologians would say about this type of stuff. And Horatius Bonner said this. Oh, actually, sorry, let's go to the quote. That's my fault. He says, if you are Christians, be consistent. Be Christians out and out. Christians every hour in every part. Be aware of half-hearted discipleship of compromise with evil, of conformity to the world, of trying to serve two masters, to walk in two ways, the narrow and the broad at once, it will not do. Half-hearted Christianity will only dishonor God while it makes you miserable. This is not dishonoring God, it's disrupting your life. So he says, some have given themselves over to this Balaam Balak dynamic, and they're cracking the door, and they're deluding the gospel, and they're waffling in truth, and they're compromising. It's a sad thing. He goes on to say, some of them also follow the ways of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans was this movement that there's a lot to be said about it, but one of the overarching things that certainly you would find in Jesus's ministry that he would rebuke in leadership is the Nicolaitans developed this approach that came with a very domineering, authoritative style of leadership. Some historians would say it is this influence of the Nicolaitans that uh, had a a strong influence in some of the Roman Catholic uh, strategy and philosophy as they were building the Roman Catholic Church and how they established priests among people, above people someone else to stand in the gap, that you can't get to God, you gotta go through me. That that there's a, a way of leading where faulty, imperfect leaders, pastors, start to lord themselves over people, start to obsess over authority, and start to miss the mark in understanding that this is a call to servant leadership. Whoever wants to be great among you shall be your servant and serve the least of these. And he's saying, there are some among you who are becoming the Nicolaitans. Some are making compromise and some are becoming terrible leaders. Is that not like a strong word? There's this interesting, I don't know, pattern 
You notice as he's writing the letter, he sometimes refers to his audience as you, and sometimes he refers to them as them. There's you and there's them. There's you and there's them, and you are a part of them. Think about that statement. You are a part of them, and some of them are following the ways of Balaam, Balak, and the Nicolaitans. I've seen so many faithful, wonderful, godly people going through challenges wondering, what changed in my life that suddenly this walk of faith has become more difficult? Doesn't seem to come with the momentum it once did. Doesn't seem to bear the fruit that it once bare. Why is my relationship with Christ and my experience seeming different now? Because you are being affected by them. As a church is what he's saying to Pergamum. Yeah, listen, this is a community, a body of believers. And when a group goes that way, it impacts everybody. When churches across our nation start to lose their mind in terms of theology and sound doctrine and what the Bible actually says and how it ought to instruct our life, you start to experience the byproducts of them. That is Jesus coaching like a real coach, like a Bobby Knight kind of coach. Anyone like the old school coach? Come on, just get me there and let me run through a wall. And I, I think it's a, it's a tender thing that he says. You have to know this. And he then turns and he says, but some of you, you're, you've held tight. Man, I find these people to be so impressive. Not thrown in the towel, you've not given up. And for those who do so, you will be victorious. And he goes on to say, and you'll receive all this stuff. This blessing, this profound favor of God upon your life and his just distinguished stamp of approval, look at this. I think the one image in there that I find the most intriguing is this white stone that is given to him. There's that statement that says there will be a name written on it that no one will know. But haven't you found that there's a lot of people out there telling us what it says? You gotta be humble again when you approach the book of Revelation. It actually says right there in the sentence, no one will know. We should just be careful chasing down things that I don't think are within our reach. But it does say some things about this white stone. And, and there's really four primary camps. And this is where, again, I, I tell you, like, I'm a, a bit of a nonconformist. I, I think the, the separating of groups that we sometimes create isn't helpful. But there's a few different ways to look at this white stone, right? And the first way would be to look at it as a trial, okay? So what would happen is you think of a court of law and you think of a jury and they would cast a vote publicly in the, in the courtroom. And if they were voting guilty, they would hang, hold up a black tablet. If they were voting innocent, they would hold up a white tablet. And so some would say that white stone is the declaration and pardon and the innocence and grace that has been extended to us in the, the most distinguished of ways in terms of the legality of our sin in a sense. You have been voted and declared innocent by the judge of heaven. Man, I'll take that interpretation. Anyone like, give me the white stone that says despite your brokenness and despite your imperfection and despite the times in which you get it wrong, you stand redeemed and in Christ justified and viewed uh, through that lens by your heavenly father. Some is, it's a trial. In addition to that, others, it is a token. Now, now think about in our context, maybe someone wins a Super Bowl. I think this happened a billion times to Tom Brady. Every time he would win, the mayor would give him the keys to the city. You ever heard that statement? It's, it's kind of like this reward, like, hey, pal, with this, you can get in anywhere. You have access. You have privileges to partake and experience uh, things within this city. And in many ways, that's one way of viewing the white tablet. Some would say, well, 
Clearly, it is the privilege that we now have in Christ. It is this token that allows us to step into a space and relationship with God that we're not worthy of. Somehow, we've now gotten the credentials to do so because of Christ. We've been awarded this token of credentials. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is by tribe. So some will say, well, in the Old Testament, if you go to the temple, and what you'd find is the high priest had to wear all this you know, attire and I mean, this guy was making mega church pastors look bad in their fashion. The, whole, the high priest would have all kinds of different things going on. And one of them was on this vest or, you know, plate on his front, the high priest would have 12 white stones. And those 12 stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And so when the high priest would enter into the holies of holies, the high priest would go into the presence of God it was a symbol to say all these tribes stand secure in the presence of God. That was a way of thinking about it, that you have right standing in his presence. So some would say this token is to say your, your victory's reward is you have right standing in the presence of God. It's a great way of thinking about it. Lastly, the other way of thinking about it is a trophy, which it's the type that you have to earn. No participation deal here. No, like, everybody's a winner. No, you've got to defeat some things. You've got to conquer some things. And you've got to live a victorious life despite what comes your way. And some will say, yeah, the, the tablet is the victor's reward. It is the trophy. And people adhere to one of these four groups primarily. And again, I look at it and I think, Yes, <laughs> I'll take all that truth. Why leave any of it on the table? If it's on the menu, I'm gonna order it. So I think all that could very well be it. I don't know. I, I, I can't tell you with great confidence. I think it has to be this one, but I do believe that you will find a lot of you know, verification in scripture that we have been um, declared innocent and pardoned by God. I think you will also find that we have been extended privileges as heirs to the kingdom and children of the most high God. I think it's also a token. I also think because of what has been done on our behalf by our high priest who tore the veil, now every single one of us has right standing in the presence of God. And I do believe that heaven will be a trophy room. In fact, I believe baptism is one of the trophies of heaven. And I think for those who don't compromise, those who remain faithful, those who stay to the course, and those who understand that, hey, my God is coming back and he's going to deal with this. How's he gonna do it? By his word, that is sharper than a double-edged sword. Folks, this idea that Christianity can survive without the Bible is absolutely nonsense. It is the word of God, his written truth, and the source of just brilliance and revelation in our life that is going to refute the darkness and wickedness in our world. We, we shouldn't be abandoning scripture when Christ says, I'm coming back and I'm gonna fight them with my word. I'm gonna fight them with my word. And I'm just telling you, I, I do believe that God stands ready to throw the ultimate victory celebration for every single one of us. But you have to remain faithful. You have to stay to the course. You have to stay white and knuckled around your trust in Christ. And life is gonna come with hardship. It's gonna break your heart at times. It's gonna come with some confusion. There's gonna be some things that just gross you out by the wickedness of our world. But you can do this. You can do this. And again, you can have tears in your eyes, but you can still be a champion. And by the grace of God, you can't miss. Amen.